Hi everyone, I'm Ryan. I'm Siam's friend from undergrad. I'm now a second year PhD student studying physics here at Harvard. And I think today what we're going to do is basically give a tour of the lab space. Card access. Our lab is somewhat unique in that we've kind of taken over what was historically the chemistry library. So it doesn't look like so, your typical. Uh, why don't you explain to me why uh, a physics lab is, you know, in a building with uh, you know, chemistry and chemical biology going over. I guess there are many branches of science which are interested in the things that quantum mechanics pertains to, not just physics, but also chemistry, biology, computer science. So there's a lot of interdisciplinary connections, like even on the very practical level in quantum research at Harvard. So in this particular instance, my uh, PI is joint appointed in the chemistry and physics departments, and so our lab is actually in a chemistry building. I guess now we'll walk into the, the main lab space. It's, so okay. let's go. Why don't you s tell me something fun about the library as you're... Yeah, so the maybe an interesting thing about the library is it's not as easy as you might think to just kind of take this and requisition it as lab space because there's actually like historical aspects which need to be preserved, I guess. So for example, these chandeliers have to go somewhere and I think we can't actually begin the renovations until we find someone to take the chandeliers. So if you're interested, let us know. This is kind of our main conference area. And so it's where we have our weekly update meetings, where we lunch, just kind of hang out. I guess it's rather unique among physics labs in that we have an unprecedented amount of uh, sunlight here. So that's quite <laughs> nice. We also have a nice uh, TV over here where we kind of give presentations and so on. So our, our lab space is kind of, I guess, three floors. The upper floor is mostly office space for the grad students and for the PI. And then here on the base level, we have our actual science lab space. And then on the bottom level, we have more office space. So I how, guess... How many students do you have at the lab and how many you know, professors or teachers? Yeah, sure. So the lab is headed by one main professor who we call the PI. So that's Kong Kuen Ni in our case. And then there's a total of, I think, around 15 grad students, postdocs, undergrads who work in the lab. Uh, each experiment usually has about three to four people on it. So we very much use all the chairs here. So before we may kind of jump into the physics, I want to give maybe like 30 seconds to a minute of introduction, like the very basics of quantum mechanics, like the bread and butter of, of the subject. And to do that, I want to just talk briefly about like our favorite, most simple element, which is like a hydrogen atom. We have like a, a proton over here, electron over here. And the important point that's kind of relevant for a lot of the work that we do is that you can think of this electron as a, isn't rigorously correct, but one way you can kind of conceptualize it is this electron is a bit like a planet orbiting the sun. It has these like different orbits around the atom, and each of these orbits corresponds to a higher energy level of the, of the atom. And so the, the insight of quantum mechanics is that this electron can't really be like in this, this middle spot. It can't, it can't be there. It has to jump all the way there if you're thinking about the next excited state of that atom. And so this is a kind of jump, to, uh, an energy gap. And the moral of the story is like quantum mechanics is jumpy. Quantum mechanics is discrete. And when we talk about controlling a quantum system, what we talk about uh, on the most practical level is we have like one energy level over here. We have a second one over here. And we want to bridge that gap. This is some gap. We want to jump the atom up there. And the way we do this in the lab is we have some atom, so I'll draw a ball, and to actually provide that energy, we strike it with a photon, a photon of light. This is a laser beam, laser. And that photon has to have exactly the right amount of energy to, to you know, kind of bridge this gap here. And so a lot of the things that I'll talk about in this lab tour will be locking these lasers onto like a very precise you know frequency so that we can get this energy exactly correct very precise timing so that the atom lands in exactly the correct spot on this picture and and, and so on this is so so the takeaway from this is like quantum mechanics is precise discrete in our group we basically have one main lab space here which is divided between like three experiments All right so i would say on a typical day the lab usually has around 10 to 12 people working in it at any given time. And ba the basic layout is this area you see over here, which is chairs and computers. This is kind of the control area. Okay. And so each experiment, as you can see, maybe we can come over here. 
each experiment has like five or six monitors associated to it. And each of these monitors is constantly kind of giving you an indication of, of various signals and measurements that you're taking in real time. And so the, the, the typical way these experiments would go is we ask for some, for example, laser pulses to be sent with a very specific timing interval. And then we send those pulses, we observe the signals we get on the computer, we do some data processing, and then we, you know, based on what we see, we update the experiments and go forward with that. You know, why it has to be so precise, why it has to be so cold, you know, talk about, uh, let's say, an application and, you know, um, why precision and, you know, such level of details matter. I would say one of the interesting things about quantum mechanics is that maybe unlike the physics that you would learn in high school or, or maybe in early college physics class, which is very much F equals MA, you know, classical physics, ball rolling down a hill, that's all, that's all great and it's, it's true, right? But when you get down to the single particle level, so in our lab we're dealing with single atoms, it turns out that things are very kind of discrete and precise. So for, in, for instance, uh, the energy levels that an atom can in, kind of occupy are, you can think of it kind of like a ladder, right? Mm -hmm. So there might be like a ground state, a first excited state, a second excited state, and then each of those levels is, is spaced with some energy spacing which corresponds to a frequency of a laser. And so basically if we, if we have an atom in the ground state, and in our experiment we want to put it into some excited state, we have to be able to address that energy gap to a very fine precision. And so what we do is we hit those atoms with a photon, which is basically like a particle of light, which is of a very fine-tuned frequency. And that's, that's kind of why we need such precision in these experiments. I guess I'll start by explaining kind of what are the three experiments that we have in our lab. Uh, one of them is, is uh, dealing with potassium and rubidium, so we call it KRB, because these are the element symbols on the periodic table. And that experiment is really interested in studying how chemical reactions work on a very like fine-tuned timing scale. So for example, like when you study chemistry, you kind of have this picture in mind of like inputs to a reaction, outputs of the reaction, but what happens exactly in the middle is kind of a, a fuzzy area because everything happens very quickly, like at a fraction of a nanosecond level. And so what we try to do in our lab with this particular experiment is really look at how those reactions proceed on like a very fine time scale and get a sense for exactly how it is. For example, two atoms might, you know, come together and form a molecule or like what are those intermediate stages which are, are kind of glossed over maybe in your typical chemistry textbook but actually are relevant for, for the physics of chemical and, reactions. And what would that knowledge help you kind of understand? Yeah, to give an example, I think people studying medicine, pharmaceuticals are very interested in understanding chemicals at a very deep level because if you want to, for example, design a new drug, you need to know, you know, what are the reaction mechanisms of a certain chemical, you know, what is the best way to go about designing a certain therapy without just taking shots in the dark. As it turns out, it's very hard to do computer simulations which actually give you this like fine-tuned amount of control to, to resolve the important things that one might hope to know um, to basically design something in a smart way. Rather than kind of simulate these with like a supercomputer, which is actually infeasible on a lot of scales, um, we hope to just kind of play it out in the lab, see how it goes and, and learn something new. The first thing I'm going to explain to you are two experiments that we do which involve sodium and cesium. And so we call them the NACS experiments. Uh, in our lab parlance, they're called NACS 1.0 and NACS 1.5. And this basically refers to the sequence in which we built the actual experimental apparatuses. But both of these experiments uh, involve, of course, two atoms. One of them is concerned with molecules that we can make from those atoms. And the other one is concerned with like single atom physics that we can study, like not without building the molecules. Maybe I can start by explaining the molecule experiment. This would, I, I say, I think this is kind of one of the cutting edge experiments that our group did that kind of brought us to the forefront of a lot of like quantum molecule physics. What we do is we take a cesium atom, we take a sodium atom, and then we merge them into a single molecule. And the important thing is that this molecule is automatically in what we would call the ground state, which is like the lowest energy configuration that that molecule can take. So in, in general, if you're, if you're in like a chemistry lab, you might like have a beaker of molecules that you synthesize in high school chemistry or something. Those molecules are going to be very complicated. They're going to be spinning around. They're going to be vibrating. They're going to be excited. There's all kinds of things that a molecule can do. 
Uh, but what we really want is for that molecule to be like sitting still. We want it to not be vibrating. We want it to not be spinning. We want it to not be like excited into some higher state. And it turns out this is very hard to accomplish unless you can like really control those atoms and cool them down very nicely, bring them together in a controlled fashion to build that molecule. What are all these, by the way? Yeah, so each of the experiments has like three or four monitors and they're constantly spitting out data at us that we can analyze in real time and kind of update what is the next experiment we want to run. But essentially, I guess we can, we can maybe take a closer look here. All of these plots are analyzing how well we're able to load and trap single atoms into a lattice of, of laser beams. So if I zoom in here, uh, yeah, I don't know if you can see, but in this like uh, you know digital picture here, you can actually see that we have nine atoms on a square. And so what we do is we we load all these atoms into this kind of cloud, which is called the magneto optical trap. It's not, it's kind of fancy. It's not really that important. <laughs> but the, the the idea is basically we take a cloud of atoms, we turn on this lattice of laser beams, and then we trap individual atoms at each of like the intersection spots of those lasers. And we can, we can drag them around, rearrange them into all sorts of neat patterns. And it turns out like the, the configurations, uh, like the one you see here, uh, all correspond to like a different pattern of interactions that you might see with those atoms. This array on the screen is really like the, this array of zeros and ones is basically the target that we want to rearrange our atoms into. So you can see we've got like ones here. We want an atom at that spot. We want an atom there, there and so on, and you can see we've run like 156,000 repetitions of the experiments. <laughs> like we need to collect a lot of statistics here uh, to really draw out the correlations as best as we can. Um, and then of course, like an important thing when you're doing science is to keep track, to keep careful notes, right? You want to keep track of everything you do, all of the parameters, and so we, we keep a very careful notebook on a daily basis of all of the experiments that we run. Um, this guy here, this is called an oscilloscope, and what it does is basically keeps track of different signals that we need when we run our experiment. And so you can see, like, there's a bunch of different colorful channels here. Each of them corresponds, in our case, to, for example, different lasers. So this yellow pulse you see here, you can see it's kind of at zero, and then all of a sudden it jumps up. This corresponds to us turning on one of our lasers. If we zoom in here, you can see there's like another uh, smaller pulse. Let's see. Like this guy, for instance. Oh. This guy, for instance, is our blue laser. I don't know, it's maybe harder to see. Uh, this green one is a microwave source. And basically, when we run our experiments, we need all of these lasers to be very um, precisely timed with respect to each other. So, for instance, maybe I can just stop this. I can show you how it's going. Uh, we need this pulse to be on for exactly the amount of time that we ask it to be on. So in this case, it would be for, for like a microsecond. Say we want like this, this blue laser needs to be on for a microsecond, which is a millionth of a second. It needs to very quickly turn on, stay on, and then very quickly turn off. And the scope is basically a way that we check to make sure that's working as we expect. What is the cost of one of these this, oscilloscopes? Yeah, the scope can cost, I would say the scope probably costs thousands of dollars. If you want to get a scope that can, you know, give you real-time data uh, for like nanosecond scale or like gigahertz frequencies, this will be, which is like a billionth of a second or faster, those scopes will be more expensive, say tens of thousands of dollars. So it, it really depends on what you're looking for, I would say. Um, so it seems like the more precise the instrument is, the more expensive it yeah. naturally gets. Exactly, exactly. And a lot of the equipment we have is made for very specific purposes. And I would say also the more specific you get, the more expensive you get. Yeah. Right, so the first thing you'll notice about our lab space is we have all these like very thick looking curtains. Yeah. These are basically because we are running lasers at very high power. And at these powers, they can, for example, start fires if you're not careful. Yeah. Uh, they can blind you if you look at them. So. You really need to be very careful when you're going into these lab spaces. A lot of the time when we're working with the optics, like, the, you know, for example, like changing a mirror that like a powerful laser is pointed at, we'll definitely wear something like one of these safety goggles. Um, 
each of them is rated to like block a different laser wavelength. So oh, wow. you see a lot of people walking around like that. <laughs> uh, that's because you don't want to like accidentally point a laser in your eye and go blind. So whenever you're running these experiments, this sign has to be on to show that the laser is in use. Oh, that's, that's so cool. And um, the curtains are to make sure we don't burn down the place, basically. We don't want any accidents. We've never had any big accidents. So now we're walking into this kind of jungle of cables. All of it serves a purpose. <laughs> someone, someone knows what all of it means. Yeah. Each of us knows what a very like specific part of it means. Collectively, we need all of this you know, for various electronics components that are part of our experiments as well as, you know, taking laser light from one space and fiber optic cabling it to another space of the laboratory. These blue cables here, all of these cables have laser light running through them. Oh, wow. And what we, what we like to do is basically keep all our lasers or most of our lasers on a table over there. And then we might need to, for example, share a laser between two experiments. So we'll take it over there. We'll couple it into like this fiber optic cable. We'll run it like through the ceiling there and then put it down on the table that we really need that laser to be working on. Let's see. And then these, these cables, these black cables are mostly electronics. And together those, those kind of account for most of the madness that you see around you here. How do you work here? How do you navigate the space? Yeah, it's pretty tight. <laughs> it's, uh, it's one of the reasons we're, we're kind of expanding into new lab space. I think probably we'll end up moving one of the experiments so that we can have more space dedicated to just one. Briefly, to answer your question, we do it with, with great care. <laughs> uh, for example, I think you can probably fit like two or three people working in this column at one time, but it can definitely get pretty crowded. Oh, pretty that, that table right there looks so cool. This table? The blue and yellow lights, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I guess I can maybe explain to will you. I, what, will what I not go blind if I... Don't, uh, you'll be okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so... What are, what are these equipment? Yeah, what we're looking at here, this is a blue laser, which is basically meant to excite a cesium atom from its ground state to one of its first excited okay. states. The way, as I, as I was maybe mentioning a bit earlier, we need this laser to be kind of finely tuned to exactly what that transition would be. So we calculate, we find in the lab, look, what is the exact frequency of the light to jump from this ground state to the excited state, and then actually, if you, if you look behind you here, uh, what you see on, on uh, that scope over there is a signal which is basically constantly monitoring what the frequency of that laser is and bringing it back to the, the place that we want it to be if it starts to kind of run away a bit. Um, that's called servoing the laser. What does this equipment cost? Yeah, so this guy here, it's really three components. I would say like this is a green laser, this is what's called the titanium sapphire doubling, or not a doubling system, but it's a titanium sapphire uh, laser, which basically takes that green light and through a very specially designed crystal outputs a different frequency. And then the third step is that we double the frequency of that light. And so all three of these together, I think you're looking at something like a bit north of 150K. Uh, and that's just to get the blue they light. They are blue so. equipment. This is, <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah, so, so, so one thing you learn when you're working in an optics lab is that not all colors like of lasers are, are equal, like some of them are much <laughs> harder to, to obtain than others. So this green laser, for instance, we can pump out a bunch of green power, with, with it's relatively easy to get that. Uh, it turns out blue is very challenging. And so what we need to do is generate that light in a three-stage process, and that's why this whole system is just for one color of light. So like, uh if it were just the green, it would cost about like maybe a third of a third 50, of the cost. Fifty thousand, and like the blue, uh, you know, cost three times more because to do certain experiments, you need the blue light. Exactly, exactly. So for for our particular applications, we really need that light, and this is really one of the only ways you can get it. Yeah. So maybe another interesting thing to point out is, even though you can't see it, there's actually another laser that's running like here. Yeah, yeah. Through these mirrors. This is because it's an infrared laser. And so that laser is operating at a frequency which is above what the human eye can actually discern. And as you can imagine, we have to be especially careful when we work with these lasers because you know you, you can't see where they're pointing uh, yeah. without using a special kind of card that can fluoresce in the presence of infrared light. Um, uh, are you gonna like burn your hand 
Or yeah, uh, that, <laughs> that's a, I mean, for, for instance, we've, we've had times when we're putting a new laser system together and maybe like one of these twisty ties is not entirely secured and then the cable will fall a little bit into like an invisible laser and it will start to smoke because <laughs> this laser can be very strong. So certainly, yeah, if you, if you stuck your hand into this beam path, it would maybe feel like a pinprick immediately. Some lasers are, are much more powerful and we're much more careful around those lasers. Um, you certainly, in general, never want to stick your hand in front of a laser. <laughs> it's, it just never ends well. Maybe, I, I don't know if you can see here, but the, you can see a kind of like flickering on this mirror. It's kind of like flicking on and off. Yeah. Like over here. Yeah. Um, this is exactly what we were seeing on the scope back there a little bit earlier when I was mentioning we like pulse the laser on. What that means is basically we have our atoms in a glass chamber and we want to hit those atoms with three microseconds of blue lights. It turns out like this is what we might need to take that atom into like a highly excited state for our experiment. And so what this beam path is basically for, like this, this device right here in particular, is for switching that laser on and off very fast. So, you know, for instance, it could switch on and off in a few billionths of a second, because that's the kind of precision that we would need for this kind of pulse. Then we take this light, it goes into here, and this is one of these fiber optic cables I was talking about. The cable goes up above our heads, and then so this guy here is really the belly of the beast. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of complicated optics happening inside here. And when I say optics, what I mean is really mirrors, lenses, oh my Lord. fiber optics. This is, um, this is, this is it's, insane. It's, it's very busy. <laughs> yeah. So whenever we work in here, we need to be super careful not to touch anything that we don't need to touch. Because if you jostle one of these like mounts, for example, you see here, uh, we might lose our atoms entirely and it could take us like a week to find them again. So that's the kind of alignment precision that we need in these experiments. Who set this up? This is the work of, I would say, a generation of PhDs. Oh, wow. uh, so it, it took probably three or four years to kind of build this up from the ground. A lot of that was also kind of figuring out how to do various things. So there are certain like novelties that are present in our experiments that we had to tweak a little bit before they worked. Um, but in general, I would say it takes three, four, five years to build something like this. Wow. What does all this cost? This? <laughs> that's a good question. I, I think you're probably looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars of optics right now. There could be specialty equipment. So for example, this cable, this cable alone can cost a couple thousand. Some of these lenses cost hundreds of dollars. Even just like the stable mirror mounts. So this, this mount right here is kind of holding a mirror and that needs to be super stable. And so it's probably hundreds of dollars just for that one mirror. Some of the more expensive stuff you see here is, is in the center there. I, I guess we can't really get a good viewing angle on it, but um, what's inside there is a glass cell which contains a dispenser of cesium atoms. And when we run our experiments, we eject cesium atoms as a kind of gas in that cell. The cell is held otherwise at vacuum. Vacuum system, the cell itself, you know, that's also, you know, I'm sure it's close to $100,000 just to get that. Maybe a fun thing, our atoms need to be very cold when we do these experiments and we have various ways of using lasers to cool down atoms. I won't really get into the nitty gritty there, but at the end of the day, when we start running the experiments, the atoms are just a few micro Kelvin, if you, if you look at their actual temperature, which makes this experiment one of the coldest spots in the universe. Because if you go way into outer space, you know, outside the galaxy, very far, the ambient temperature would be something like 2 to 3 Kelvin, which is like minus 270 Celsius. This is just like a millionth of a Kelvin, right? So above absolute zero. So this is extremely cold. Everything is very slow. Um, and that's what lets us actually probe it at the single particle level. Another thing that you'll see everywhere projected in our lab are these computer screens with a lot of numbers and megahertz on them. These are readings from what is called the wave meter. And what that is, is a device which is constantly monitoring many of the lasers that we use in our lab to make sure that their frequency is stabilized to where we want it to be. And so as an example, like this is the monitor for one of the excitation lasers I use in my experiment. And I can actually, I can see now that it's actually not correct. It's wrong. 
It should be somewhere else. We can fix it, actually. I can show you kind of what we do. Um, this device here is called a, a servo. And um, what it does is it helps us to, to find like the correct frequency for that laser uh, and, and lock onto it. Okay, so the laser is uh, uh, less healthy than I thought. <laughs> Turns out I'm going to need to do a more uh, thorough check. I can't correct it live. This is kind of the, a very useful diagnostic tool for us.